Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. I've got um, a wonderful selection of videos and things to talk about. I hope everybody's brought their harmonica tonight because I've got a few things for you to play as well, which I'll put up on the screen. And um, so let's kick off. Um, so I'll give you a little overview of what I what I'm going to do. Um, I've the, the certain obscure harmonica videos, which I've really enjoyed and which I think show the essence of a player and, and what they do well. And so I'm going to play some of these and I've also transcribed and tabbed some of what they do. And um, we've got uh, quite a range. We've got something from Gregoire Marais. Uh, I didn't ask them, by the way, I just got stuff off YouTube and did my thing with it. Um, Gregoire Marais, we've got something by Tommy Riley. Uh, we've got Stevie Wonder, my, one of my most favorite ever harmonica players, and one of my most favorite solos. And then we've also got, um, I've transcribed the harmonica from Hard Rain that Toots Thielmans plays. And I've tabbed it, and I'm going to show to you and talk about the extraordinary session that I had with him um, back in 1997, April. So um, I think the first thing I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to start with something very cool and simple. Now, one of my favorite videos is a video with Gregoire Marais playing a Miles Davis song called Jean-Pierre. Jean-Pierre is like a simple bluesy thing. And in this video, you will see Gregoire um, swapping, doing a solo. And later, you can look this up the whole thing, but I've, I've edited and shortened it for, for these purposes. And before we start, I'd like us to have a look here at the actual music for this tune. And um, if you've got your harmonica, please have a go at this. And let's just familiarize ourselves with the melody. So um, have a look at this. And, and um, I, I suggest like everybody unmutes and we just have a go. I'll just play it. I've tabbed it out and, and uh, let me just play it for you. It's not gonna sound amazing, but here we go. So it goes like this. One, two, three, or four. So that's the melody. And then Gregoire does this incredible solo, um, all based around the kind of A minor pentatonic thing. So I just wonder, would anybody like to volunteer to sight read this. I'm hoping that you can all see it okay. Maybe just the first line or, or play it and let's have a bit of audience participation right from the get go. Who, is anybody, um, I'm just gonna have a look around and see. Does anybody wanna have a go at this just for fun now? I'm just to let you know, everyone is automatically muted so they have to press their space bar to unmute themselves. If you, if you want to have a go, I suggest raise your hand and then whoever's the host could select that person and because uh, I can't see everybody here. What do you think of that uh, as a as an idea? Anyone? Does anyone would anyone like to have a go? Or should I just play you the video? So just play the video for a second, please, Adam. That'd be oh, great. OK, thank you. OK, okay great. So um, I'll just do that again. Let's get this up. So this is this is the excerpt. Marcus Miller playing, uh, Gregoire playing this theme. You'll hear the trumpet playing the melody first, which I've just showed you, and then and then Gregoire comes on and does a pretty cool solo. So let's let's have a look at that. Um, If there's any problem, just raise your hand and I'll stop and start again. Here we go. Thank you. 
So I'd, I'd like to have some reaction to that. I saw that Chris, was it Christelle, Christine, was rocking like mad. I wish I had one of those great Vladimir Putin type screens where you could just <laughs> see everybody at once. But um, would, any, would anybody like to just give me a bit of reaction to that first? Maybe have some questions. Um, so if you click gallery view, you can probably see everybody then. Yeah, uh, good idea. Great idea. Yeah, I can see at least, wow, we've got four pages. Um, let me go to the people that are actually live. A anyone there just want to talk about that or? Um... Uh, this Bob, Bob Allen here. Um, yeah. uh, Adam, it, it reminded me very, very much of um, uh, Miles Davis in Tutu. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm curious um, which, uh, you know, I'm, in a way I'm offering you different plates of food here. That's how I think of it. And I'm curious who's, who's touched by that, who, you know, what, what would you take from that maybe to, to learn to, or, or maybe you think that's not for me, I, I prefer something else. Wow. Well, yeah. I liked it. I liked it. Yeah. <laughs> May I say something? Yeah, sure. It was all about the rhythm. The notes were there in harmony, but really pay attention to the to the rhythm and play with the afterbeat and play with that and just listen to the uh, battery. I mean, to the drums and to mm. to the to the bass and play around with the rhythm. And it was so good, my God. Yes, yes. That's it. I, I think absolutely that that's what blows me away. And the other thing is that, you know, if you said to somebody, you know, Marcus Miller could have anyone in the world on stage with him. And, um, you know, one thinks, wow, a harmonica player, a chromatic player. And, and that, that playing, that's just on an A, you know. He doesn't even play any kind of normal blues licks that you might associate with that. He, he's got completely his own sound. And the way the solo builds as well, I think is extraordinary, you know. Good. So um, would anyone like, should we just have a quick look at the, at the chart and maybe people could have a go at that quickly? Does anyone want to see that again? So, so that, that melody there, who finds the, by the way, who finds this kind of tab useful? Is that? So if we were, if, if, if you were, if I was maybe going to practice this or, or going to become familiar with it, I'd become familiar with the blues scale. And then, so that's the A minor blues. Uh, yes. Adam, yeah. Could you just check that your, the status of your original sound button because you cut out the high end now? Oh, um, okay. You want to turn on original sound? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's 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 on. Right, cool. Yeah, I I, I will keep an eye on that. Cheers. Turn on original sound. That should show, shouldn't it? No, it, it should be saying turn off. If it's on, it says turn off original sound. Yeah, the button says turn on original sound. You that want to click that. that? Original sound is off. Yes, so you want to yeah. click it so it's, it's on. Yeah, so that it's on. You, you want it on, so you need it to say, turn off original sound. That's, that's, hang on a second, sorry. Yeah, that, that's what you've got, I think, Adam. It's saying that, isn't it? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure, I mean, this has been, just just let me check this. It says turn on original sound. Yeah, well, that's wrong. It should say to turn to off original sound. Yeah, you need because to if that. it's saying turn on original sound, it means that it's not on. Yeah. So if you click that, Adam, it, it, when yeah, you came in, it, it was Let me try this again. Yeah, okay. How's that? That sounds okay now. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry for the, we had a whole technical thing on Wednesday, so 
there's yeah. a little detail but just coming back to coming back to this um this particular track um i agree um getting i i'll talk about how i you know get my different elements of music together and one of them would be just to listen to that and and really focus in on on the beat and keep the harmony simple and um i think that that's you know that that's an extraordinary um it's an extraordinary video i recommend you if you just google marcus miller gregoire mare you'll see that that's the video which has um they've got frank mccomb join them it's 23 minutes long and um there's some it's just extraordinary i think it's it's one of my favorite i've seen it many times and i've used excerpts of it in a little program i made called harmonica stories a few years ago anyway i think we'll move on and now for something completely different so i'm now going to play you a, um, a piece of music and i'm going to ask the classical experts amongst you to identify this because this is tommy riley playing with judith durham she um what she's a fantastic pianist but also a dame now and was a member of the new seekers um so she's an incredible musician and but a vocalist but here she is on a very strange piece of bbc um adam just on a small thing she was a member of the original seekers right. not the new seekers she oh, was right. the original okay. singer yeah oh thank you for that i like i'm that. old enough to know it <laughs> good detail um well caught um and um again you can watch the whole clip and those of you that came to my workshop in march at the benslow college i we did the first half which was uh, a little classical piece um which um we we looked at but in that same video there's an other another piece called the fairy tale which i'm going to play you now and I couldn't get the composer of this. They don't mention it. I tried Googling, but I knew some of you classical experts would be able to tell me after this. So. what that music is anybody no i'll find it for you okay well if somebody can tell me i'd be very curious now um you, you know one thing i'd say um tommy riley has always been a hero of mine of all classical players and i once had a lesson with him in 1987 i looked him up in the mu directory and I just rang him up and I said, could I come and have a lesson with you? And he was very generous. He didn't charge me. He, I drove all the way down to his home in, in Frensham or some, somewhere like that. Um, Roger, Roger Trowbridge will be able to correct me on this. And, um, and he gave me a tape 
which was him playing with the Harper's Schuyler Kanga. And on it were some fantastic pieces, the Chopin Minute Waltz, um, there was a piece of Frederick Revsky, there was a Stravinsky. It was just amazing repertoire for the harmonica. And I didn't know anything about the harmonica then. I had this, um, I had this 12 hole, I mean 16 hole harmonica. In fact, I'll show it to you one second. Um, this, this is the, um, the 16 hole Larry Adler that I got given when I was 17 uh, by my dad. Um, and I, I still can't really pl don't play it much because I can't deal with the last four holes. I get lost on harmonica, but it's a great harmonica and I took it to him and I didn't know anything about tongue blocking and all I could play was a bit of, you know, a few sort of Toots, Thielman's licks and so on. And he was very, very generous. And, um, and the thing that he, he said, which is, um, the one thing I uh, technically is he said, don't move your head. So when you play, you need to get used to moving the harmonica and not your head. And in that video, um, he kind of he demonstrates that. And so I've done a lot of practicing, either looking in the mirror or else. Um, all you need is, in a way, a, a, a window with a reflection to see that your head is not moving. And it's not perfect, but keeping that as a principle, I think, is kind of essential for, you know, if you're going to try and play, um, as I've been trying to learn the old um which i <laughs> i i plucked up the courage and paid a few bars of this to Rob, robert bonfiglio when during our sound check but if you're doing this kind of thing um if you're doing that kind of thing it, it's so important to get um, to get your head really centered and still and calm and move only the harmonica. And this as well, another of my favorite harmonicas, this is a Brendan Power CX-14. It's an absolutely amazing harmonica because um, I used to, I had a book of flute pieces which I was practicing Bach with and I did that on my normal CX-12 but those were transposed. Whereas on this with the 14 hole you can play anything that's written actually for the violin because it goes down to the low G. And I, I'm a great fan of this harmonica. I keep meaning to ask Brendan to make me another. And what he did was he actually chopped two CX-12s in two and put them like this. And I have got to give a special shout out for, um, for John Cook of East Coast Harmonicas because John Cook has just serviced this for me because Brendan is too busy doing his amazing Lucky 13s to do servicing for me. I don't know, maybe he does it for some other people, but he's kind of, he's not up, not up really up, not interested in doing that. But this is an amazing harmonica. Um, so I'm very fond of it. Uh, where was I? Yes. So back to Tommy Riley. So how do you, I've been looking at different techniques. I've been doing a lot of piano jazz, piano teaching since March because of lockdown. And what I started doing was making videos where you can see the music going by and stop it and move it around. So I'm going to play you one of these videos which I've made, which uh, is of this Tommy Riley piece. And um, this time you will see the music and the tab sh showing. So let's ha let's have a look at that again. And you'll hear the same piece of music, but you'll see the bars and the tab. So here we go. Let's make this.
Great. So the cool thing about this video is you can use it um, to move around in the in the in the track like this. So I don't know if you can see the 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 um, the sort of transport bar, but you can drag it around and then you can say, um, just let me check out the bridge again. Um, say um, you want to you want to and you can stop it and then you could just try and play a bit of it like this. You'll notice that I do everything three times. It's an absolute obsession with mine if I'm practicing. And then, to ideally, what you'd want to do, but you can't really do this with this kind of video, is you'd want to loop it. So people who, um, you, you could, well, I won't go into talking about Logic too much, because this, these were made in Logic Pro, um, Logic Pro. So then you can play it from here. So then say I want to try that again, I can just move this back a little bit and play this again like that. Um, the other thing that makes this very useful here is, is that it causes you, I've, I've recorded a metronome track in which I've played in myself, because it causes you to follow the bars really strictly and to hear, hopefully I've done it accurately enough that you can hear the timing as well. And then for people who are not used to counting, I've put in you know the bars that you can count because part of learning to play absolutely is developing your inner metronome that once it's switched on it mustn't switch off until the end you have a slight power outage and you're basically jumped off the ship or kicked off the train and so that's one of the biggest problems i had being a late starter of the harmonica i didn't really pick one up and start playing it till i was working on a cruise ship aged 28 before then i didn't touch the harmonica at all and then it took me a long time after that in my 30s even to play it a bit on gigs. So um, that's why I'm really interested um, in people that want to take it up at any time. And I'm also very interested in different techniques of learning to play and studying the music. So um, so that's um, that's also very useful here. So I'll just go a bit further and let's let's find a bit where perhaps this this B section so you can we'll just check out this B section so now I'm um, I'm also one of the things I say is I'm very explicit about looking at the harmonica and starting on the right hole now I noticed that Tommy Riley doesn't really need to do that but I think it's a really good discipline to just make it very active in your mind I'm going to start on hole four draw and the little asterisk means slide. So that means I can look at the harmonica and take my time and then be sure to hit the right note. great how he brings in the octaves there at the end um, again I wouldn't notate those as octaves because I think you want like the minimal of information and it's up to your ear to hear what's what's happening good so uh, let's just stop for a second and are there any questions so far would anyone like is are there any chat I haven't had a look at Adam there's, there's a question about whether you should move your head or move the harmonica is there? Yes, from Christelle a bit earlier on. Yeah, well, here's the thing. You know, I've watched a lot of brilliant harmonica players, and here we've got this rule that Tommy taught Adam one day and many others, don't move your head. Some people move their heads. Toots moves his head. Stevie Wonder's doing this kind of thing all the time. Although, when we watch Stevie Wonder play, he's very focused on the microphone. So 
you'll see he picks up his harmonica as he's playing and then he's dead on the mic and also he holds his hands in a very set position I've noticed like he holds them sort of like this and I think that part of that is for him to locate himself that he always has maybe his fingers touching I'd, I'd love to interview him or read an interview about him because as far as I know there is no interview or recording of Stevie talking about the harmonica it's like the secret of a Rishi you know in um, in, in Hindu mythology they have like the very advanced Rishis and they'll only give these secrets to very few people so I wonder you know I just I'm flabbergasted that in the age of the internet there isn't more information of Stevie talking about and I'm sure it's not for a lack it's, it's not for shortage of people saying please could we have an interview with you about the harmonica so uh, yes so um, where was I with this yeah any questions about Tommy Riley and this particular video or shall we move on I'll take that as a wait there's a new message oh wait a second yeah um, there's a message here what about small markings on the harmonica itself um, Lena Freeman asked me what about small markings draw Adler has knit little little notches which he feels with his mouth I think Suzuki or some manufacturers well I don't believe in that at all I don't think that you should feel anything along the mouthpiece at all it's just going to disturb you especially once you start moving around what I am a great fan of is making um, I like the way that Brendan has put on his CX-12 here are the 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 C's in other words hole 1 hole 5 and hole 9 I think those are really useful and um, I think that you know the CX-12 with that mouthpiece it lends itself I'm a great fan of numbers as well I'm I cannot understand why harmonic manufacturers don't make the numbers absolutely clear and absolutely standardized and um, just grab one other harmonica with me now. Um, I've, I don't have the melody star with me, but this this is my little um, sticker which I've put on um, melody stars, which has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so hole one and hole five are the same color. Hole three and hole um, six are the same color. Three and seven, and so on. So you've got to have some kind of visual way of using the the, the harmonica in that way um, another thing which I should mention um, is also that I use a huge amount the keyboard if you think of like um, modern modern jazz players on harmonica Matthias Heiser uh, myself um, Howard Levy um, uh, Antonio Serrano all of these guys they use a piano and they use and I would say that if you are serious about learning chromatic whether you're playing classical or jazz I think that you've got to get used to uh, some kind of visual some kind of visual uh, marker so I, I use this a lot when I'm teaching um, can everyone see that so if I if I press the notes here you can see what notes I'm playing and so I do a huge amount of holding the harmonica. This is how I learned to play chromatic first, was that I would play um, a tune on the piano. It's like years of restaurant gigs, and that's how I first really learned to play. And then you can you can also get a sense by looking at the keyboard of the different holes so we know that that's hole one we know that that's hole two we know that that's hole three and we know that that's hole four so i'd spend a lot of time really getting used to
all of that kind of thing is is very helpful to you locating in your mind the different keys and that's something that again i would love to ask stevie i mean how does he think of keys he's also a piano player does he visualize them or feel them i don't think it matters but i think that you need to have some kind of visual reference for the keys that you're playing as well as reading which is why i'm so keen on tab i'm really keen on tab and i should say something about tab because uh, i used to be i my lessons um when i first started taking it seriously i had lots of lessons with jim hughes and jim was quite sort of snooty about tab um i don't know if he still feels the same now but at the time he rightly said you know you should just be able to look at the music and play the note and get to know learn to read properly but the thing is that when i started doing chromatic harmonica workshops like um for the chromatic weekend people wanted tab and so i thought um okay i'll do some tab and then suddenly i found that writing out the tab actually made me learn the notes and the holes even better so i highly recommend this because one of the keys to playing chromatic is whole awareness. You've got to know what hole that you're on at any given time. I'm sure a lot of you chromatic players, and I still get massively lost. I still have this blackouts where I'm not quite sure what hole, but the more you do, the quicker you recover. So that's something that I, I really um, recommend a lot. Um, so Robert um, Ivacic has just said, said, I have a harmonica friend who wrote a tab and notebooks about folk songs and polka and waltz songs from Slovenia is using a set of harmonicas like us diatonic players so does he not play one on one chromatic player only for all the music plays so um i'm not sure what you mean but i think it's horses for courses you know i've always been absolutely obsessed with playing everything on a c chromatic harmonica and for many years i actually bought this harmonica from brendan in um in 2004 he made this um this cx14 and um it's it, it, i played it but i would never play it on gigs and i probably still wouldn't because it's only in the last year that i've really started doing exercises to learn those two holes um now i know that some players like ivonik pren um the french he's a brilliant french player which you should check out great great and very nice guy Ivonik plays a 14 hole Suzuki and he he's completely relaxed with this he never gets lost in it and I think that if you've played if, if you have started it's a bit like if you have started long enough ago then you can get, deal with those two extra holes but for me they're a pitfall because I'm so used to the bottom hole being C that that I, I I'm still learning to do that so um let's go to another piece of music i'm just keeping an eye on the time here and um i think we can have a look at the moment now at um this is a, a video uh, of antonio serrano playing a mccoy tyner blues um and he this is it's an extraordinary piece of impro improvisation so it's quite a long section it's like three or four minutes but you'll hear them play the head and then you'll hear him play six or seven choruses of blues in B flat. And he just takes them up and up and up and up and up. And I'm hugely admiring of this particular performance. So let's have a listen to this. Um. <laughs> Thank you. 
pretty incredible uh, playing that, I think, isn't it? Um, so again, one of the things I like that I've got this video on my computer and I can move around it in the same way and maybe check out things. So um, I would recommend, if you can, um, having the video on your computer. You can. I bought a program by as a legal program called Mac Video Video Converter Pro, and what it does is you just grab the URL and drag it and put it in this, and it downloads the entire video. It's much quicker than using these kind of pirate websites. And so I, I only discovered it a little while ago, and I've just been downloading loads of videos and then putting them in logic and beat mapping them, or else this one I haven't actually done. Uh, I could show you, um, actually, this might be interesting to, to do. Um, if, if I show you uh, my logic screen, um, which would, um, uh, which I, have, I haven't transcribed this yet, but I can show you what we would do, transcribe, you know, how, how I would transcribe this, or, or repeat, repeat sections of it. So um, let's just let me give you a taste of this. Um, so this is this is the um, this is that video loaded into Logic Audio, and I've got the I can look at the, um, the, the the movie is here as well. You can see it. But the main thing is that I've now got it divided up so that. Um, so that I know this is the the head, and it's all lined up with the metronome. So, Right, so that you can see the bars align. If I want to repeat that, I can just do, hang on, I want to hear that again. And then the other thing, the great thing about logic, I'm not a logic expert, but you can slow it down here. You can just drag the speed down and you can take it maybe as, as reasonable. And now, now we can hear. And here's something that I really recommend. If you can slow it down and listen to it like this, and try and grab, this is a really important thing in transcribing, is that you, you, if you're trying to hear anything, you want to focus on just a couple of notes and then stop. Let that make an impression on your ear, and then see if you can find them. So I can hear... The important thing there is that I've literally picked three notes to find. Important that you have a lot of silence. And you don't let other notes further ahead or behind crowd your ear. So now I've got that, I'll do a little more. So I want to hear just that section. So let's say I want to check those out on the keyboard. Um, that's again helps me to understand where we are. But that's just an E flat seventh. So now I'm getting a much clearer idea of the picture of the tune in my head. Now, let's suppose then that we want to check out some of the more ambitious things that, um, that Antonio is playing. So I can go now to the first chorus. Let's listen to the first chorus. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, ten, 
11, 12. And so now let's go to the course where he's really tearing it up and see if we can hear anything of what he's doing. That's still what he's still kind of he's still holding back a bit, you know, building up the solo. That's still quite this have this this the fifth chorus now. That's a nice thing that he's doing there. He's quoting from um, Duke Ellington, things ain't what they used to be. I don't know if oh, I'm in the wrong harmonica. I don't know Brendan's one yet. So that that's from things one, that ain't what they used to be. Now there we get interesting. Let's have a listen to that. So anyway, um, this is this is one of the methods that I've used to produce these. We don't need to go further into them into them now, because um, um, I'm just looking at the time and I've got some other great videos to show you. Um, again, any questions that we might look at at the moment? Anyone want to? Uh, I mean, I can keep talking wall to wall for as long as you like, but um, are, there, are there any particular questions? I think um, one thing somebody said earlier on um, that I think they said when they were looking at the video, they said that Antonio does move his head. But I, and I think a lot of the guys move around like this because they're playing laterally, sequentially in a linear fashion. But if you were doing anything which involved intervals, accurate intervals, um, that is a style of improvisation which I haven't seen um, jazz players do. On um, I haven't seen jazz players do huge intervals. And what excites me so much, um, you know, Robert Bonfiglio is an amazing um, mouth switching guy. I, you know, I've seen a uh, a video of him online talking about mouth switching which is basically I don't, I don't know how to do it properly it's basically playing a note out of this corner and then playing a note out of that corner by moving your tongue i think that's the principle but to be able to do that as accurately as robert is just mind-boggling and if you think of the improvising of wayne shorter wayne shorter uses a huge number of range you know he's easy to leap up and down on the saxophone and I've also always thought in terms of developing your own sound as a harmonica player the, the, nobody's really got into um, into mouth switching uh, properly uh, from a sort of improvisational point of view uh, well that I know of maybe some people are doing it but it's just um, it's kind of exciting to think uh, well what if somebody really got on on you know, on, on a very large harmonica with 16 holes, imagine if you started doing mouth switching like you were playing Bach, like Franz Schmel used to do. Uh, so that's a very interesting thing, uh, corner switching. Yeah. Uh, so Bill Eborn says, I've been practicing corner switching by playing guitar voicing arpeggios. And Philip Jers does it. Um, that's interesting, Jacob. Thanks for those that feedback. Um, so. Um, Robert has got a question which is going to take us away, but save the question and ask me at the end because I've got two more pretty amazing videos to show you. Um, so I'm going to move on now to Toots Thielmans. 
and I, I had the good fortune to do a film with him called Hard Rain. I say I do a film with him. I actually did very few cues on it because the story was that um, he he was booked to do the soundtrack here in London at CTI Studios, which is now closed, which is a huge studio in Wembley designed for orchestral sessions. And I'd never done one of these before. And I was terrified, like seriously terrified. Um, and um, I thought I said to the 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 composer and the team had heard a jazz tape that I'd made and they thought, oh, yeah, this guy can do it. And they said, do you read? And I said, well, sort of. And they said, yeah, you'll be fine. So I got there. And when I got to the studio and all these people started pouring in and tuning up, the first title music was um, was the, I just looked at it and I thought I've, this is like a nightmare. I thought I'm going to need half an hour with this part in a room by myself just to get used to this. But um, I'll show you the part because I've I've transcribed it from um, I hope I've got it close at hand here. Oh, yes. Um, just just one second. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll play you the video in a, in a second. But first of all, um, just imagine this. Imagine this situation. So there I am at nine o'clock, and Toots could not do all of the all of the session. It was over several days, so they had me come in at the beginning, and I, I had to go with this title music, um, and um, then he turned up later, and he had to go, and he struggled with it. So immediately my status went up and they said, stay here and be a consultant. And then I, I, I was there advising the composer, Christopher Young, uh, for a few days. And then Toots had to leave at the end of the week. And then I got to do some of the cues. And by then I was kind of on top of it. But um, I'd just like to play you the, um, the original titles from Hard Rain. Um, they, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I don't know of any feature film since that has really featured the harmonica in the same way as uh, they chose to do that. And um, obviously Christopher Young was aware of Toots and his sound. And when you hear it, uh, I'm going to play the full title music. And it's important that you get the scene because the, it's, the hard rain is about a town being flooded. Um, this is made in the mid 70s, mid, mid 90s. So it's kind of quite prescient. But the town being flooded and the build up to it is 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 quite interesting and then the harmonica comes in at a certain point near the end let's have a listen to this
So, are we all gonna die? <laughs> I love that beginning. I love that beginning. Are we all gonna die? So, um, you can. I mean, it's it's an it's. I can't think of a film which 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 has got such beautiful orchestral music with the harmonica solo over the top of that. And um, one of the incredible things about, um, you know, after the first more, I played that, but I got, I got kind of some of it done. And um, I thought they were going to kick me out. And they said, they were very kind. They said, no, that's fine. We can use what you've done, but let's see what Toots does. And he struggled quite a bit to do to play it as well accurately and then of course once he was used to it quickly he produced that fantastic performance and the other thing which i remember from this is that there were times when um there were bits of, there were lots of different cues and some of them were th those that cue is based just on two chords f minor and a flat minor um, but there were other cues where the, the the strings were really atonal and shifting and toots played some stuff over it which was just mind boggling. And I don't know how he heard what he was doing because you couldn't have said, oh, well, you know, this is in this key or that key or, and so on. It was just, just incredible. Um, so what I've done um, is I've also made a notation video of this. Um, and I'd like to play this to you and just have a look at what this looks like. Um, the, um, this me, I've got, oh, no, that's a different one. Um, so this is this is the same piece of music, but notated um, with with um, with tab, and also in Logic you can put the um, note names in the actual head. So I think it's like a very useful way of learning if anyone wanted to actually learn how to play this. So let's have a listen. Oops, I nearly left the meeting instead of sharing the screen. Here we go. Um, Correct one, I think, is. I've got so many videos up here now, just one sec. My brain is trying to. Oh, yeah, that's the one. Right. Again, this is really useful if you wanted to practice this. You could just drag drag it back to the beginning and um, maybe have a go at the notes again. I think it's quite interesting, the note choice there, when you've got the, this is in F minor, by the way, but I've deliberately taken out the key signature so that the it, all the notes show as accidentals. I think that's kind of more useful here. So again, I think, that using the draw the draw c on hole eight and then it's kind of fun to see if you can maybe play along with it and so on so um so th that that's uh toots's that that's a was a great experience playing with toots and uh, and hearing what he did on that and again it's such a simple melody but 
to, to his his sound and his phrasing and his timing and his laid back w w is just still staggering to listen to. Um, so I'm just going to look at a question here, which just to take a break from talking on. Robert um, from Slovenia says, how can I learn other keys on a C chromatic harmonica? I got used to A minor and D minor and a bit of E minor, but that's similar to diatonic range of positions I play minus G7 blues on a chromatic. What would you suggest? First, I got myself, I got to get myself a CX12 back again in my house. I would say, um, Robert, you know, I, I've got a young student who's just switched um, from, from playing a melody star to a chromatic. And I really like the chromatic because um, if you if you want to get a first chromatic, because it's got eight holes and the holes are exactly like the first eight holes of any chromatic in C. And so what that does is that gives you the opportunity. Um, oh, I see. You just said he's got a chromatic and a CX12. Well, to, 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 I'm, I'm glad you like the um and uh, Christelle mentions Baghdad Cafe with William Gallison. Excellent. Yeah, William is something else. William came to Bristol a few years back, and a few years back, and he also fascinating harmonica player. I remember in his workshop him demonstrating corner switching and being blown away from that. But I'm afraid, personally, I haven't made any progress with corner switching just yet. But um, to answer Robert's question about chromatic. It's a very simple way to do it, which is that you want to pick a tune that you like in C. Just pick a tune in C and start getting to know the degrees of the scale really clearly so that you can, you know, maybe you, pr you probably know this already, but, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. You want to be able to hear that and then go to one flat. So you go to B F and just go. And think of like get everything get again. I, I I become tongue tied because I think I don't know how you learn to play the harmonica without a keyboard. I, you know I would think of it visually. Hove two. Um, it starts on an F. F G A B flat C D E F. <clears throat> as long as you can pitch it, and then. I just try five notes at a time and you do some work where you imagine that it's a room. I think of each key as a room which you need to know in the dark. And basically um, you need to be walking around the room and you can say, oh yeah, that's that's F and then find F and then try just one, two, three, four, five and try that in that key. And then also have a tune that you like listening to, which is in that key and jam along with it and keep coming back to it in a circular way so that you you make sure that you come back to it within a week within a month and keep a list of it i've got a list in fact i'm going to show you this everyone my mind is just rushing from one thing to another um i've got a list of all stevie wonder's uh, songs let me show you this i'm very happy very proud of this you can get this um there's a spreadsheet on uh, on on stevewonder.net and um i'll just share this a second and on this on this spreadsheet um you've got they've got every single harmonica solo that stevie wonder played on so you can you can i i basically formatted it so it took out all the other stuff and it's only got the harmonica so you can go from pretty baby in 1962 right up to um you know the ones in green are ones that i've kind of checked out but there's there's loads to check out here and they're all that this is an amazing one little more time with you with james taylor you should check that out it's just the most incredible um it's the most incredible piece of harmonica playing on james taylor albums hourglass and um gosh we're running out of time anyway um just can I have a word from the organizers? How do we have to stop at 9.30? How's everyone's um, stamina? Uh, we're OK if you're OK, Adam. Yeah, I, 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 I won't keep you longer than that, but because I've just got um, 
I've got one more. I've, I must show you the Stevie Wonder thing. But he, here, the, you see, this is really useful as well. And you can look right up to the most recent one. He did. He, he's done a couple of things with um, Take Six with Snoop Dogg. It's it's really great. Um, it, it's it's really great to to go through. And you can find that on this website, uh, which is StevieWonder.net. And there's a page which has just got all the sessions he's played on, in um, on other people's albums. Um, let's just stop screen sharing, and um, and then let me talk about. So Stevie Wonder, um, as um, as uh, as uh, Pete, our chairman, pointed out, I, I had the uh, fortune or misfortune to step into his shoes, which was kind of crazy. Um, I had in 1999 a couple of uh, in the same year I got asked to play with Sting and then within a few months with uh, the Eurythmics and both of them were to learn Stevie Wonder solo and try and reproduce it and you can find these videos on YouTube if you google my name with the Eurythmics or Adam Glasser and um, it, it it was it kind of nightmare because I just think it's pointless trying to perform in public a solo by somebody else. Uh, I don't think I could do that again, um, but it was a lot of fun doing it and it massively improved my harmonica playing. But um, one of my most absolute favorite Stevie Wonder solos is his solo from That Girl, um, which came out as a single in 1982. And at the time, I wasn't, I'd only just started like messing around with harmonica. I was like 27, 28. And at the end of the street where I lived in West London, there was a music shop, a record shop, which was owned by a very famous ex-dance band leader called Harry James. I think that's the right surname. Anyway, at the top, he had a young guy who was selling all the records that were coming out, you know, pop records, Sting and the Police were popular then, all sorts. And then below, he had a basement and that was where he had all the jazz stuff. And so I used to go down to the basement and spend, you know, Saturday mornings hanging out with him and talking to him about jazz and so on. And one Saturday morning he came in and he said, I've got something to play you. You like the harmonica? Have a listen to this. This has just come in. Now, the, it, was, it, was the, it was the video of that girl. And um, I found, I happened to go to a Stevie Wonder concert in 1989 and I remember him playing that girl and the thing that struck me about it was that he played the solo straight off the solo he'd recorded on the single so that was really interesting to me because he does the same thing when he does if you google Stevie Wonder playing it uh, um, kind of most recently at the O2 or Wembley or something you, you'll hear that if he plays if he plays um, Isn't She Lovely, he plays the phrases that he actually plays on the record. And that to me is a musical strength. Say hello because... to Spark. Hello? Oh, sorry. So that to me is like a musical strength because um, it's, it's, it's the, the solo is compositionally so strong that you need to hear it in the album. And so when he played it in 19, 1989, I thought this is just amazing. Um, now the great thing about this on YouTube is that the harmonica is much clearer on this um, kind of rough recording of him playing live at Wembley. It's much clearer on this recording than it is in the original because in the original it's mixed kind of further back. But up here, because you know it's a more rough recording, it's really up front. And so I'd like us first just to have a listen to this. Um, it's the most incredible solo uh excuse me raving about it but i just think it's just something else this so let's have a listen to this and and uh, be patient and just watch the full track and again like um toots comes in with um you know his harmonica well into the track by the time that the whole tune is set up for stevie's solo so have a listen to this <laughs> She's 
listen to half my mind That girl thinks that she's so smart That soon she'll have my mind She thinks in the time you flash She'll be free and clear the stars With a current motion to rescue love that to leave torn apart My tears to joy from sad She says she keeps the upper hand And she can please her man She doesn't need the love to make him weak She just love to keep him strong And inside me there's no room But I bet it won't be too Good. So that's um that's a pretty incredible that's a pretty incredible solo. Um, I'm coming very close to the end. Uh, I've got a, a little um, thing to show you, which is that I I have also um, I just just let me show show you this. If anyone's interested, I can put this um, in the share it with everybody. But if you wanted to. If you wanted to get into that a little bit, the thing that he's mainly playing on is an A sharp minor pentatonic, and um, let's just have a quick look at that here. Um, have a look at this, and you see that this is the A sharp minor pentatonic with the key signature. It's horrendous. Five sharps, um, B A A sharp minor. So um, if, if, for example, Robert was asking, how do we get into different keys? Well, this is a good place to start is just take a tune like this. You've got to be in love with it at some level. You find an equivalent piece of music and just learn a pentatonic scale in that key. So here. then you start to discover um, all the kind of little licks that he's doing and um, I'll just play you the video which I've made 
uh, which is of um, this notated version of the solo here. Um, let's just make sure I'm screen sharing again. And um, gosh, which one is this now? Finding that good. Is it this one? Yeah, here we are. Um, so this is just the solo notated. I deliberately haven't written in all the tab here yet because there's a little tip which I would like, which I've only recently discovered, which is that if you've got a really tricky key like this and maybe you don't recognize the notes, one of the best ways I think of learning the notes on the stave, we can see that this is a D sharp. So um, a D sharp in hole three, actually, that's completely wrong. It shouldn't be that. It should be. A, um, up there it's so that's actually hole nine it's hole nine at, um, it's a mistake I'll have to redo this uh, but you see I was putting it down the octave it's completely wrong but the the main thing the main point I'd like to make is this which is that if you've got um, a note there Put in the tab and then search through all the different notes and find the same note and then write the tab just for that note. So I went through all the notes and then I found, oh, yeah, there's I was still thinking wrongly. So this is a mistake. But you can see that those are the same notes. So I was looking for the same notes. And if you're tabbing something, maybe you're getting used to a new key for, for this practice section. Just spend a bit of time and tab a few notes and look through the whole part and then tab those notes and forget about the rest. Then do something else. And um, and that way I've found is, is, is like a really good way of getting yourself reading music and remembering the notes and, and starting up um, from the bottom. Folks, I think I've come to the end of what I have to play you. I'm just checking. Um, Adam, can I ask you, why did you decide to put that down as uh, A sharp? Would it have not have been easier for you to have I called it B flat? Uh, the re answer to that question is that when you're in sharps, deal with sharps. When you're in a flat key, deal with flats. Otherwise, it makes... It's very confusing. And there are conventions around that as well. No, no. What I meant was uh, uh, deciding what made you decide that it should be a, in a sharp key rather than decide it should be B flat. I was just wondering. I'll, I'll tell you because the other alternative is if you if it's not in, if it's, it's in the key of G sharp minor. Now, if you had put A flat minor, that means that you would have seven flats because you're All effectively right. playing in C flat, major is the relative key. Yeah. So C flat has <laughs> got seven flats. So when you, I mean, yeah. you know, uh, if that's if you're going to write it out. But I mean, that's only useful to have on a page in front of you and then just check it. And the rest of the time, you want to be using your ears and take a while. I mean, I mean I've been listening to that solo for 20 years and I've only just transcribed it now for this session because I thought, well, Anyway, 